two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, okay. One, two. Mm.
Testing. So much fun.
Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church. We're so glad to have you here today. Uh, just to start off the morning, it was really fun to come in and find out that my microphone didn't work. And the only thing I had was a flashback of about a year and a half ago uh, when lightning, or two years ago, when lightning struck our building. And I'm so not thinking that's going to happen today. But I will tell you that my microphone, my original microphone, uh, is not working at all. So I'm having a little bit of a moment. Uh, I do not ever ever want to deal with another insurance company uh, with lightning again. So, of course, we had to have a massive lightning strike, and everything that should work does not work this morning. Uh, but as a matter of fact, like my sermon will be off my phone. So this will be fun. Um, we just have a few announcements that we want to bring your attention to. Uh, still have uh, some spots available for the leadership planning retreat this coming weekend from nine until two. All we need to know is, is if you are a beef or chicken person, I need to know that by no later than Wednesday because I need to know what kind of beef I'm gonna buy or what kind of, uh, your chicken's easy, you're gonna have chicken. So, uh, and then, uh, but I, I'll have to start getting that ready to go to cook and stuff on Friday. So, um, that's this, this week. And um, wanna remind you that we have a, a paint party scheduled for this coming Sunday. If you have not had a chance to sign up for it, please feel free to do so in the back. It's $25. You saw the image on the announcement slides this morning as uh, of, of the image that we're going to use for um, the paint party. Uh, it's a cross picture with uh, fall leaves around the outside. It's pretty neat. I, I think it looked good. Uh, I think people have fun with that. So that'll be this coming Sunday from 6 to 8. And I uh, want to remind you that we still have some spots available for anybody that wants to volunteer for the after school program that starts September 8th. Are there any announcements that I've neglected to mention of events taking place? Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing I've, I neglected to mention last week is we're so glad to have Nancy back after her, her uh, two week uh, vacation. It was really great. Uh, and we're also thankful for Sally for playing for her while she was gone. It was just so seamless. I wanted to say thank you. So it was. It just seemed like everything was perfect. I didn't even remember to say it. So, uh, are there any other announcements that we need to make sure? It's not a birthday day, is it? Praise God. All right. So, let's take a moment, prepare ourselves for worship as Nancy begins with our prelude. Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to worship with us. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs to be in the of the court of the Lord. My heart and my flesh fainted within me for joy to the living God. 
Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk in uprightly. O Lord of the host, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the many blessings that you generously bestow on us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom and opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you for the refreshing rain. Be with us now and send your spirit to us. Let us feel you near as we come to worship and honor you, to learn more of how you would have us live our lives to be pleasing in your sight. These things we ask in your son's name. Please join me in the opening hymn, number 27, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King, help us Thy name to sing, help us to praise one God all glorious, or all victorious. Come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of hope. sacred witness bear in this glad hour thou who almighty art now rule in every heart and ne'er from us depart spirit of power to the great one in three eternal So we now come to that time of our worship service where we lift off our prayer concerns together as friends and family and, and uh, just want to bring your attention to some of those. So this week has been, uh, it's been a little hard. It's, uh, it's been a little weird. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that, um, people come and ask Josh, uh, what, what it is that we're supposed to be doing today. <laughs> uh, so like I've, I've already had people ask me this morning and about how, how do we talk about some of these things that took place this week? For example, uh, this last week, uh, one of our people from Perry that grew up in Perry, Chase Moore, uh, passed away uh, from COVID, and it's that's those are from his words and from his family's mouth. And then his mother-in-law also passed away, and so uh, I'm just asking that you keep Cedar Moore uh, and their children in your prayers as she copes with not just the loss of her husband but also her mom in the same week as they battled COVID. So we lift them up together. God in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Then we pray for Tracy Deacon Turner, who uh, also passed away this week as she was battling COVID, and uh, her eight children that she leaves 
um, as they try to figure out how to, how to do life without mom. Um, and so we lift her up together. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And then I ask that you pray for my ministerial colleagues, Steve Smith and Brett Nation, as they try to navigate how we stand in a, a, in a world uh, that we find ourselves that's real and at our front door. And uh, as they navigate through this, there's a lot of things that we have to take in consideration, uh, however we feel. <laughs> so we lift these things up together. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Um, so with that being said, let me give you our list that we have that is not, again, uh, it's not exhaustive in the sense of we don't have everyone here, but we have as many as we can. So we lift up the family of also uh, Deborah Staub and the family of Tracy Turner, Chase Moore, uh, my, fam my friends Jay Spradlin, the family of Pete Schultz, the, the family of Christine Klingerman, the family of Jen Skovanek, and the family of Debbie Gurch. We lift them all up together, God mercy. We've been asked to pray for Paisley Weatherly, who is the great, great niece of Kathy Wilson, uh, who is also dealing with RSV that is running rampant right now, and we lift them up together. God, in your mercy. We continue to lift up Erling Glass and uh, Mary Kerfoot, who has uh, been diagnosed with COVID, asked me to say that. Um, we lift them up together. God, in your mercy. We ask that you pray for Robert and Melina Cunningham, who are having health concerns, um, and uh, lift them up together. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. In the midst of the joy, though, uh, Elizabeth uh, decided in the midst of all of the things that are going on in their lives that they decided that they were going to come home and uh, have a, a, I don't want to say quick, had a wedding yesterday in Bobby's backyard. Uh, so Elizabeth Cunningham uh, was married to Mike Schreider yesterday uh, in Bobby's backyard, with surrounded by their family, um, and, and uh, we just celebrate that joy with them. God, in your mercy. Uh, we ask that you pray with uh, Jenny Barrientos, and uh, as they they pray for her grandmother Donna Rorson, who is having serious uh, medical issues. Uh, we lift them up together, God, in your mercy. Uh, we pray for Raymond Leisure, Sarah's father-in-law, who is in the hospital and has COVID, and uh, is, uh, it's, it turned into pneumonia, and so they've got him on oxygen, and we lift him up together, God, in your mercy. We continue to pray for Suzanne Skovanek, who uh, had COVID, but is now off the ventilator and is doing better. Uh, so we lift her up together, God, in your mercy. We also pray that you pray for Paula's dad, Jim Choplin, who had lungs, is going to have lung surgery this Tuesday at Stillwater Medical Center. God, in your mercy. Uh, we pray for Gene uh, Ramsey, Gene Chance, and Ernie Lukert, who is, uh, I had the opportunity to go see him just about every day this last week which was weird for me because it's not every, it's been a long time since I've been able to do hospital visits, uh, but uh, we were able to do that, and he is uh, in between uh, good and bad days, uh, so the goal right now is to get him back home. So we lift him up together, and all of those that we have mentioned, God, in your mercy. Again, we continue to pray for Betty Dillon as she continues to recuperate, as well as Hattie Fisher. We continue to lift up Hannah Schwant, uh, and Tex Shelton, who is walking down the street now with his prosthetic, and Anita Meadows, who is still having some water retention issues. Uh, we lift her together, all of them together, God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Had a great visit with Jim and Marilyn Avey this week. Uh, is uh, responding well to treatments, and we're just praying for uh, uh, some more test results and things of that nature. God, in your mercy. Continue to pray for Gary Fancher, who's having some heart issues lingering from his time with COVID. We lift them up together. God, in your mercy. I ask especially that you pray for the family of Judy Anderson, who passed away uh, after her long battle with cancer. Uh, we lift her up together. God, in your mercy. 
continue to lift up Vicki Vaughn, who is doing well with the treatment, uh, but ask that you continue to be with them as they have continued success. We also pray for Benita Foster, who is still having uh, chemo treatments now, right? She's like on the fourth or fifth one at this point after radiation. And for those of you that don't know, this is Benita's fifth time to battle cancer. So uh, we lift her up as well as Jacob Anderson, who is doing extremely well with his bone marrow transplant. Continue to lift up Jenna Sharp and Joy Stevens and Rick Schweer and Mike Stotts, all who are battling cancer today. God, in your mercy. Uh, we've also asked that you continue to keep Still Modern Medical Center in your prayers. I know that sounds weird, but they're about 100 employees short right now between all of their locations. Um, either nurses are retiring or they haven't been able to find any more to replace those positions. And so all of our hospitals in the area are having a little bit of an issue uh, filling places. So uh, we lift them up together. God, in your mercy. Uh, again, we have a lot that are on our hearts and minds that are not on this list. The only reason I don't ask from the floor is, is because as we do it online, there are some times that we mention prayer concerns that people don't really want broadcast all over the internet. I, I just ask that you continue to be in prayer for all of those that we have not mentioned this morning. God, in your mercy. So let's take a moment. Prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. God, we wait. We watch and we long for you. Renew our powers and refresh our spirits and restore our well-being. You give new strength to the faint and power to the powerless. May your church be found working among those who lack resources or rights. May we seek to care for those who cannot care for themselves. And we, we pray for the lowly and the humiliated. We pray for relief organizations, especially the Child Protective Services, the, the DHS, the YWCA, Wings of Hope. Almighty God, we ask that you be with us, that you would continue to guide us as we minister to others, as we pray for our feeding programs, our homeless shelters. God, we ask that you be to them a tower of strength. Almighty God, we pray for the great powers of the world. We pray for the strong nations and mighty governments and that we pray that their power be used properly, that the poor are protected, the weak are not exploited, and no one is oppressed. We give thanks for all who have cared for us in times of weakness, for those who have uplifted our spirits and given us new hope. We pray for our friends and families, especially any who are finding life difficult at the moment. We pray for any in our community that feel neglected or rejected. We pray for all those who are in weakness of body and mind or spirit, all who have come to the end of the tether. We think of all who are losing their mobility or agility those who are losing their memories, even those who've lost their grip on reality. Of those who no longer trust in anyone, and those who doubt the love of God. We think of all who are caring for loved ones in illness, and we lift up this list, even though, again, it's it's not fully exhaustive. There are names that we have somehow or another omitted or neglected to mention. We give thanks that Christ is our healer and our companion on the way. 
that he will not allow us to be lost. And we pray for loved ones departed who are renewed and refreshed in the love and light of God. And we ask, O God, that the light of the world truly be the lamp set out on the lampstand today. Amen. I want to invite our children uh, that it is now time for playground. If there are any of those that would like to go, now is the time for you to head on up to the big room. That is for anybody up to, I don't think we even really set a limit, except for uh, Brandon, you're not going. Uh, Quentin doesn't get to go. Brandon, uh, you're more than glad to go play. I mean, uh, and, and Madeline, you have to use the slides, so you can't leave. But if you would like to go, now is the time. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Addie to come on up and read the scripture for me. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand up, stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic power of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready for ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in the supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message will be able to, will be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am the ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. You may want to turn the pulpit mic down. Yeah. <clears throat> so now that we did that, uh, I have a tendency to make this microphone freak out. So that's why we don't do that. I want to say thank you to our youth that I've been just kind of uh, guilting into reading our scripture. Uh, I, I About four or five weeks ago, uh, you know, I, I just had this weird moment. I just, I, I needed to drink water. So I said, Quentin, you're going to come up and read the scripture so that I could drink some water. It's really what happened. And then after that, my daughter says, you never asked me to read scripture. And it, I'm a senior in high school, and I should get to read scripture. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. So you can read scripture. And then Addie came to church last week, and I said, you know what? I want you to read scripture. And Addison's like, uh. Brandon says, and Kim said, yeah, she'll do it. <laughs> and so uh, I, uh, I, I want to, I just, I, w I want to do this for a reason, and I'm going to keep doing this, I think. I'm just going to start asking kids to read scripture, because I think one of the things that I want you all to be comfortable with is, is that this is your church family, and that we love you, and that this is a safe place. 
And if there's anything that we should be able to teach you, it's just that reading scripture is a holy and sacred act that we want to support you in. Uh, so we don't want you to worry about mispronouncing words because we all do it too. And we want you to feel safe in this place as you continue to grow in your faith. So it's a big deal for me that we keep doing this. And I just think it's rather ironic or coincidental that I chose this passage of scripture back in May about the whole armor of God. Uh, this last week has been about putting on the whole armor of God in every aspect of my life from Monday until uh, yesterday afternoon. It's been, a, it's been a weird week, and coincidentally, I just picked it because it's, it's one of the lectionary texts. Um, for the last seven weeks, churches around the world have been reading the book of Ephesians. And this ends with the reading of Ephesians by saying, just simply, be strong in the Lord. What follows is one of the most familiar portions of Christian scripture, the armor of God. In a time far removed from our own time, with its sensibilities about violence and war, and things military, the writer speaks of the Christian life in metaphorical terms. Regardless of when it was written, we find ourselves in a battle just as real and just as dangerous as that of any soldier in a time of war. By analogy, there are various uh, articles of combat apparel like a belt, a breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet, sword, along with their spiritual counterparts, truth and righteousness, peace and faith, salvation, the spirit, the word of God. All of this armor seems to lean into that part that Addison so aptly read, praying in the spirit. This intercessory prayer is lifted up as the object of our armor to help us pray for all the saints. It's hard for us to understand this. When I chose this passage of scripture, I was thinking to myself of ways that when I was growing up, that this passage of scripture actually turned me to an understanding of my faith. How I had the opportunity to whoop the devil. Growing up, you know, you don't get to hear about Satan very often. We didn't talk about Satan. We just knew that Satan existed. That evil was everywhere you turned. And unfortunately, we heard all the cliches like when the lamp gets broken in the living room and mom and dad says, who did it? He says, well, the devil made me do it. But this is not that kind of scripture. I want to tell you a story about someone that understands what it meant to be a spiritual warrior. In 1522, in a small city in Spain, uh, a seven-year-old girl convinced her brother Rodrigo to run away with her. Her name was Teresa, and she is have said to have the heart of a warrior. Now, she was intrigued by the tales of King Arthur, and she dreamed of being a knight, knowing that this would be impossible for her as a girl, she hatched a second plan. She talked to her brother into going in, going with her to be martyred by the Moors, who had recently been driven out of Spain into North Africa by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Now, fortunately, they were caught uh, by an uncle who found them outside the city walls on his way back into the city. Now, I understand that there's a, a nice little monument marking this spot where St. Teresa of Avila changed her mind. You see, she never became a knight or a soldier of any traditional kind. However, her biographers credit her warrior's heart for being an essential part of the work she went on to do. She is admired still to this day for her steadfast service, her writings, and for the founding of many Carmelite convicts. Even so much so that 
it inspires the, the, the woman that we know of as Mother Teresa's parents to name her after St. Teresa of Ovia, another warrior of love. As Christians, in our efforts to follow Jesus' teachings as closely as possible, we emphasize the need to love our enemies and do not like the violence we sometimes find in the Bible. Furthermore, in today's world, we have too often seen religion and violence mixed in ways that are obviously ungodly. That's why this New Testament passage for today makes some of us uncom uncomfortable. Actually, I think it should make us uncomfortable. The other option to discomfort with the violent imagery of the armor of God is to hear terms like sword and shield as a poetic ancient language, to make it comfortable for people to hear far removed from the actual warfare. But there's a problem with this approach. It becomes lukewarm. It makes the battle that Paul is referring to here less important. Ephesians is, is a letter written to a church who lived in a pretty violent time. Many of its original readers would have, have seen and heard of the hor horrible and horrendous tragedies that the Roman Empire inflicted upon the Jews. And eventually, throughout time, where the Romans would destroy their only place of worship in their very eyes as they had to stand there helpless watching the place that meant so much to them disappear. Some in the church would have suffered persecution as Jews, while others would have suffered it as Christians. So armor was a very present part of their lives. I imagine that if we were to change that imagery for today's world, it might sound something like this. Now remember, I'm just saying what it might sound like, not what it says in Greek. So therefore, take up the whole uniform of God, so that you may be able to withstand that evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, stand therefore and fasten the gun belt of truth around your waist. Put on the bulletproof vest of righteousness as combat boots put on where whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the gas mask of faith which, with which you will be able to avoid the poison gas of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the semi-automatic weapon of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little uncomfortable with the spirit of the word of God being compared to a gun. Yet it seems to me that this image used here can be just as deadly as what we hear church people saying today in the name of God. You know, when you're growing up, you're always told that you can get more bees with honey than you can vinegar. Not me, I hate honey. And I would rather have the vinegar because that's better for pulled pork. But the part here that's interesting for me is, is that as a church, as a culture, you find more people taking the opportunity to use the words of the world in order to describe the worlds of their faith. And that's not what is being read to us here. You see, in this conversation that Paul is having to have with the church in Ephesus, he recognizes there's a cosmic battle as well as a human one. A human one that is going to cause death and maiming and hurt and violence and fire. And the cosmic one, where the, the wounds are so deep, people will never, ever feel the presence of God again. I mean, just think about that for a minute. Those moments that the church has used that double-edged sword right in between the teeth and cut away 
whole slops of people. Why? Because the world has given them a new idea. That's not necessarily biblical. A lot of the language that we use is not godly language. And it's just as deadly. In these new days, we hear about people all over the world who are in refugee camps or fighting for their lives just to be able to, to breathe. And yet we truly do not understand this. But we have a lot of opinions on it. We have a lot of opinions about our faith. We can fight for the victims by trying to kill as many of their oppressors as possible. Still, there is something beyond people who are responsible for the evil there. We have a name for that evil spirit. The church has always called it Satan. Or evil. And evil does nothing but try to divide the church of God. Every time, every time we speak words that are not from God's mouth, it destroys a piece of humanity. But it's so easy. It feels so good. I mean, it starts off as an idea, right? And then it becomes an adrenaline rush. And then all of our actions become based on fear, all combining to create something beyond the individuals. It affects, and the evil in it is cosmic. I am tired of having to have the conversation of the Facebook experts. I'm tired of having to have the conversation about medical procedures when I did not go to medical school. I can talk to you about the Bible in five different languages, but none of that will change the opinions that we form on based on the things that we see on the news. see this armor of God allows us to be, on, be beyond those things of humanity. It gives us a response. It says it is not soldiers of blood and flesh who we are to fight. Instead, we are to use the truth. Now, this is the part. This is not the place to ask whose truth. You can do that on your Facebook journey. This place, the truth that we are referring to, is the truth that Paul is preaching to the church in Ephesus in the name of God through Jesus Christ. It's in those words of truth to tell the real stories and to expose the evil. We are to live morally ourselves so that our words of truth will be meaningful. Now this is where it gets hard. We are to do whatever it takes to explain peace. Because <laughs> Jesus doesn't say, oh, by the way, while you're loving your neighbor as yourself, don't worry about your enemies. No, no. He literally says the opposite. What does he say? He says you're to what? Pray and love your enemies. Oh, my goodness. In a world like today... If that's not the ultimate test of being covered in the armor of God, I don't know what is. We know war. It doesn't leave us. So many of us were shocked to our very core listening to the news of Afghanistan. Remembering that after 9-11, there were so many of us that joined the military. Not me. I tried. <laughs> Something about having asthma and fake knee doesn't really help you. 
so many of us join the military to, to go make a difference. That's the words we use. And then to watch the news. We, we know war. seen it not stop for over 20 years. We know war. We know what humans are capable of doing. In the short term, we want to take action, any action. And it's easy to look at biblical guidelines such as prayer or faith that's doing nothing. I want you to hear me say that again. It's so easy for us to look at praying we're having faith is, is that you, you're helpless, that you can't do anything, when I would argue that it's the most powerful thing that you can do. I could give you a sermon each on the concept, uh, complex concepts of righteousness and faith and salvation and the spirit and the word of God, <laughs> but I also know all of you will want to eat sometime today. So let's get to this meat of this sermon. Let's go with the concepts that we understand best. Let's contextualize truth and peace. Is telling the truth of God doing nothing? Think about that for a minute. Truth has a double-edged sword also. Was it nothing for the victims of sexual assault? And domestic violence to tell the truth to someone and then for that someone to tell the truth to others? Many of the women who speak the truth in these situations literally risk their lives to do so and even then some die. Yet it is hearing the truth and naming the evil that is the first step to both personal healing and the transformation of societal attitudes. Because of this truth-telling and risk-taking, today laws exist to protect victims of abuse. There are safe places for them to go, and it's become socially unacceptable to engage in such behavior. As for peace, it's not a concept for the faint of heart. Even Gandhi believed that nothing could be done without, with a coward. Do you know that at the beginning of his movement, he believed that from a violent person could be made a nonviolent one? He actually encouraged to train the masses in nonviolent resistance. He suggested that they join the military first. That's how he started. He suggested they join the army, then come to him to be trained in nonviolence. did not continue this practice as he became more separated from the powers of violence, but however, he knew that somewhere we needed this warrior's heart. Like St. Teresa of Avila, she saw the struggle much as Gandhi did. She even wrote, let the soul be manly and determined to fight and realize that there are no better weapons than those of the cross. She spent her life passionately dedicated to service for Christ, and in so doing so, in, in, do, in so doing, was both beloved and hated. She worked tirelessly until her death at the age of 67, when her warrior's heart failed. To Teresa, the concern was not the use of violent imagery. It was that if one did not feel the cosmic and personal war, one would become complacent. That's, I think, the curse of today's culture. Complacent with not living in the ways of Jesus Christ. For Teresa, the tools of war were not swords, but the willingness to act rather than to speak and throw platitudes. Peace is not a position of weakness or impotence. It requires courage 
and trust in God in ways that reliance on our own strength and our own weapons never could. I pray that as we continue to put on this whole armor of God and we walk from this place into the cosmic battle of humankind, realizing that there will be flaming arrows that come at us in every angle, that we recognize this imagery from Ephesians. That we become instruments of peace, love, and God's justice in the world. That's how you whoop the devil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we reach this portion of our service and we talk about stewardship, I guess the majority of the time we're guilty of talking about only finances, money, and giving to the church. But there are times when we talk about stewardship of all of the things that we possess, not only our money, but our talents and our time, our energies. So I'd like for you to think in terms of the total picture for these thoughts. The happiest people on earth are people who have discovered the joy of giving. I cannot afford not to give. Giving is not a debt you owe. It is a seed you sow. What we often wait for God to do for us, he wants to do through us. Would the deacons please come forward? stand for the doxology. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for life and breath and the many blessings with which you shower us every day. We bring our tithes and offerings in thanksgiving and to further your work in this place. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. So I've come to this point in my life when I've started to recognize how much the pharmacies have shelves full of vitamins and supplements. You know, you can go to Walmart and there's a whole row 
just of vitamins and supplements. Vitamins that uh, strengthen our eyes, uh, make our hearts pump, and make us strong like bull. Maybe even help us with our digestive system, which I'd rather not talk about here. Or just vitamins and supplements that help our whole body. But when we come to this table, it's just simple. There's just two elements. Simple bit of bread or wafer, a tiny taste of juice, as long as it doesn't get all over our shirt. Yet in these elements, they provide strength for our whole spirit, our mind, our heart, our soul. It makes sense that when we hear the that statement, come all who are weak, weary, or worn. Come all who yearn to be strong, to have power, to be energized, to stand against evil. Come, for the table is spread. and You are invited to find your place. Come, just as you are. Please join me in the communion hymn number 204, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, verses 1, 2, and 4. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that Savior? cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing that on that night that Jesus was in an upper room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread and blessed it and broke it, saying that this is my body, which has been broken for you. Take this and eat it in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took a pitcher of wine that he shared amongst those same friends and disciples, saying that this is my blood, which has been poured out for you. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. this table of fellowship to remember the gift of your son whose sacrifice made possible the forgiveness of our sins and fellowship with you. As we eat this bread and drink this juice, may we rededicate our lives to your service. Let us pray as Christ taught. Our Father, who is heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
May we now receive the bread of life given to us freely. And may we now drink from the cup of salvation. So we now come to that time of our service where we recognize that as we, the worship may be coming to an end, this really adds fuel, literally, to the understanding the service begins when we walk out those doors. But we recognize that we're not going out by ourselves. We are draped and clothed in the armor of God, recognizing that the words of truth, when they're spoken out of love and compassion, that God will prevail in any battle that we find ourselves in the cosmic war that we find ourselves in on a daily basis. But there does come a time at the end of this moment where we need to rededicate ourselves and invite those that would like to make this their church home or to encourage those that would like just for us to pray for them. We invite all of those to come forward as we stand together and sing our closing hymn. Please stand and join me in hymn number 613, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, verses 1, 3, and 4. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. So now we leave this place and space of worship, and while so much of the road is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know that Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is here, found in this space between all things closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. So now be with us as we go in peace. Amen. Amen.